Hello, this is Michael Tracy. In this video is going to look at the Holzell slot and other locations searched by Mark Sinnott in his Boots on the Ground search in 2019. According to Mark Sinnott's book, The Third Pole, the National Geographic Expedition in 2019 set out to search the Holzell slot. The Holzell slot takes its name from Tom Holzell, who identified an anomaly on an aerial photo and became convinced it was the body of Andrew Irvin. Let me orientate some of the items and I'll go through Holzell's theory. This is the first step, and this is the 1933 high camp, and this is the modern route, though sometimes the modern route takes slightly different ledges. For scale, the horizontal distance between the 1933 high camp and the base of the first step is 1,200 feet. Some routes from the 1933 expedition are this one, climbed by Wynn Harris and Wagger, and also this one, climbed by Frank Smythe and Eric Shipton. Now I'm going to zoom in and focus just on this area around where the ice axe was found in 1933. This is the ice axe location. The cave where Tsewang Pauljor and David Sharp died is right above it. I'll put back the route taken by Smythe in 1933, as it will be relevant shortly. Over the years, the Hosel slot has moved. You can see Hosel's original designation in an older video, where he places a red circle in the still from this video. That location is easily photographed, and there was nothing there. With nothing in the original slot, the slot where Hosel was certain Irvine was, was moved about 50 feet to the west, and it is this new slot that Mark Sennett visited in 2019, though he also walked right past the old one, and also there was nothing in that one either. The new Hosel slot I'll mark with a blue body. For scale, I'll add this bar, which is 135 feet long. The Hosel theory was that Mallory and Irvin fell while roped together, and the Alpine Club rope, specifically made for climbing the Alps, just happened to snap, sending Mallory further down the mountain, while Irvin remained largely in place and only suffered minor injuries. Irvin then limped along for about, oh, say, 100 feet, where he slid into a crack and died. At least, that is the theory. I'll link to Hosel's video in the description, and he explains the whole thing. In any case, well prior to the 2019 expedition, Mark Sinnott called me up, and we spoke at length about searching for Irvin, and in particular the Hosel slot and other places Irvin could be. Sinnott was well aware of the various searches and was certainly aware of the location I had identified in the final resting place video, as that was the primary purpose for his call. Now, Mark Sinnott is a very smart person. He has a degree in philosophy, and that has influenced his climbing writing. For instance, when you climb a new route, you get to name it. One of his first major routes Sinnott climbed was a difficult ascent of the Shipton Spire in Pakistan. He named the route the Ship of Fools after an allegory in Plato's Republic, and his book, The Third Pole, very much reflects that same line of thinking. Early in the 2019 expedition, Renan Ozturk flew a drone from North Cole that took images of the upper mountain. While much of that footage remains secret, the image of the Hosel slot was released in a French-language video about their expedition. As you can see, there is nothing in the slot other than a white hand. That is the mouse cursor that Senate was using to indicate that it was indeed the Hosel slot, as he and the team examined the image from base camp. The drone confirmed there was nothing there, and Frank Smythe not finding anything there back in 1933 is a good indication that nothing was ever there. But even with the drone photo, Sinnott decided to traverse over to the slot on his descent from the summit. Upon traversing over and reaching the slot, he confirmed there was nothing there, and that the cr as the crack was only a few inches wide, it was clear Irvin had never been there. In the third poll, Sinnott writes, There was nothing there. I looked around. No one could see me. I was all alone. High above, the summit of Chumalunga was sugared against a pale blue sky. All remaining curiosity that had driven me to go off the fixed lines and descend to this spot on the mountain evaporated in an instant. There was nothing to find, nothing more to search for. I suddenly felt naked, and all I wanted was to be back home safe with my family. My attention now turned entirely to finding my way back to the security of the fixed ropes. But going straight back to the fixed lines is not what he did. I find it much more useful to look at what people do rather than what they say, and frequently what they do illustrates their true intentions, while what they say is used to obfuscate them. This is the way back, and Frank Smythe had no trouble getting up that snow ramp nor back down it after his failed summit attempt in the couloir. The terrain just isn't that difficult. Sinnott clearly states he just wanted to get back home at that point with no interest in further searching, but it turns out that is not what he did. Sinnott writes in a post-truth style that is often hyper-technically true, that is, he says he wanted to get back home safe with his family, but he never says he then took a direct route to do so. 
Instead, he describes the technical details of a route that would only be recognized by experienced Everest climbers. Recently, Jake Norton posted a map of the various searches, and he has a map of Sinnott's 2019 search. Sinnott did not turn around after finding the empty Hosel slot. He went on to search two additional spots on the mountain, at least according to Jake's map. Jake's map has Sinnott descending a difficult pitch to the west to get over to the next snow ledge. That ledge is the one where I had identified a potential location for Irvin in the final resting place video. It is that traverse over that requires Sinnott to descend facing the mountain using his ice axe for holds. It is a fairly tricky piece of climbing and by no way a normal way down. I'll switch over to this photo to show what Sinnott actually climbed. This is the ice axe, the Hosel slot. He could have simply climbed straight up to the fixed ropes that are just at the top of the snow slope at the crest of the ridge. If he didn't want to climb up, he could have just descended diagonally down the same way Shipton and Smythe did in 1933. Instead, he traversed down and across this extremely difficult terrain to reach the snow ledge. Sinnott then descends that slope and passes by the location I had marked in the final resting place. Once at the bottom of the snow ramp, Jake's map and Sinnott's narrative diverge. Sinnott states in the book that he then headed back across the narrow ledge to rejoin the fixed ropes at the 1933 high camp. Jake's map has him make this traverse over to the top of this gully, which I will call the Han Gully, as Dave Han always felt it was a prime candidate for Irvin's location. The Han Gully bifurcates at the top, and I consider both those forks as part of the Han Gully because Han was searching it from below, trying to climb up until he found something. Han searched this gully lower down on a couple occasions, but there was always too much snow, and the upper portion is too steep to physically search. You would need a very low snow year, such as 2019, where it could be photographed. After traversing to the top of the Han Gully, Jake's map has sent it turn around and head back to the fixed ropes. The way back is also not trivial, as it has some very narrow ledges to cross, ledges that would have been easily bypassed if he had just stayed on Frank Smythe's route. In the book, Sinnott does not mention this additional excursion to the top of the Han Gully, and instead has him head back directly at the bottom of the snow slope, where he still has to cross those narrow ledges. The narrow ledges are just to the east of the snow ramp. The weather was clear, and Sinnott had a radio, so it is not likely he just got lost. Looking at this image from the French language video, it is from the drone, but it is sort of blurry because of the way it was put into the video. Here is the ice axe, the Hosel slot, and this is the rather obvious way down. And yet Sinnott climbed over this way to get to the next snow ledge over for some unexplained reason. None of that snow ledge is visible in this photo. As a note, in the Disney streaming version of the 2019 expedition, they label the Hosel slot as this crack over here, which also had nothing in it. Sinnott had stated in the book that he had a camera inside his jacket, so it's not clear why no photos of this have been released. More curious is that both of those locations would have been imaged by the drone. If the drone showed nothing, why take an extremely difficult route just so you could look at places that had nothing in them? And now I want to switch over and talk a little bit about keeping secrets. There is this notion that in general people have trouble keeping secrets, and anything really big will not remain secret for long but we can look at the rate of unsolved murders in the United States. It is around 50%. It is not that 50% are not caught immediately or within a year. It is that 50% of murders go unsolved. Not solved this year, not next year, never. While murder rates go up and down, in 2022, approximately 20,000 people were murdered in the United States. Going back to 1990, the average is 18,700 murders per year for a total of 560,000. As murders are typically committed by younger people, most of those people would still be alive, and certainly there would be some people alive who had murdered prior to 1990, but it is a good range to use and keeps the math fairly simple. This means that approximately 280,000 murderers are walking free, keeping a very big secret. Even if you say there are a large number of serial killers and multiple victim uh, murders, this still gets the total down to, let's say, 200,000. But that leaves approximately one person in 1700 keeping an extremely large secret, and one that they will likely take to the grave as few deathbed confessions are made. I'll put a quiz link in the comments. If you have 500 friends on Facebook, what is the chance one of them is an uncaught murderer? But it doesn't take a psychopath to keep a secret. In the United States, approximately 1.2 million people hold top secret clearances, with a total of 2.8 million having a security clearance of some type. Thus, roughly 1 in 120 are legally obligated to keep secrets, though probably one or two may have let some slip. 
And in our own little mystery of Mallory and Irvin, there are no shortage of secrets. Photos were taken of Mallory's face, and they will never see the light of day. Not a single one has been leaked in the past 20 years, and the person who took them will not even speak of them. The photos could answer whether Mallory had a wound on his forehead from an ice axe, and whether it was post-mortem or not. While not central to finding out if he made the summit, it would shed a little light on what happened in the fall. The actual photos do not need to be seen by anyone other than a medical examiner who could write a report about the injury. I'll get into why that hasn't happened in an upcoming video and about how the hole in Mallory's head is being memory holed. Regardless of the forensic value, the monetary value of selling the photo is not trivial. But simply because an item might be worth a lot of money does not mean people will talk about it. The pictures were taken and we will never see them. That is the definition of keeping something secret. What other secrets are there? Are there photos of the original location of the oxygen bottle? Will the unreleased video of the search of Mallory's body show rocks falling out of the pouch around Mallory's neck when it was cut open with a pocket knife? Will it show two fingerless gloves being pulled from his jacket? Will it show the broken glass from the altimeter spilling on the ground? Will it show the cover of the watch slip out of Mallory's pocket when he was being pried up by his legs? Or will it show the opposite, with the team carefully inspecting each pocket and all the items being fully accounted for? And while I suspect that if the video actually showed that, we would have seen it already, but one cannot completely rule out the possibility. And while the truth probably lies somewhere between those two extremes, we will never know.